Well, I, amen. I'm so privileged uh, to have such wonderful servants of the Lord in my family. And uh, I don't know about you, but I thoroughly enjoyed the message this morning from Brother Russell. And uh, just wanted to give you a little heads up. They are just here for a couple weeks, a very short trip, uh, mostly for that uh, Mother's Day reunion that I, uh, I didn't speed off to. I just went to uh, Sunday. Uh, we had a great time Sunday evening, and uh, and I didn't get a ticket or anything happened like that, so we had a great time of wonderful uh, fellowship between the family, but they're here mostly for that, and then just to, to be able to be in the States for a, a few weeks, and so Brother Russell didn't have time or the ability to put a video presentation together, but I've asked him to kind of give us a report of the work there in Scotland, and then he's going to come and also uh, have maybe a little bit of a question and answer time so that you can get kind of some insight into the mission field and, and what it's like to be a missionary and ask the questions that maybe you've always wanted to ask a missionary. Uh, and then he's going to preach for us. So you give him a good grace and Bible Baptist welcome as he comes again to preach the Word of God to us tonight. Yeah, I, uh, I debated coming about doing a video or... Um, I thought it would be good to bring kind of a living video with me. And so uh, we brought, we were going to have three of our ladies from Scotland come, uh, come with us, and one was not able to make it. And uh, Brenda, she's not feeling well today, so uh, pray for her that she'll get to feeling better. And we have Nicole, so all of the weight of impressing them about Scotland falls on your shoulders tonight, so... <laughs> I kind of, Brother Timothy, I kind of feel like after listening to you play the piano today, I kind of feel like there's a whole lot of pianos around the world in churches that are not getting a good return on their investment. So <laughs> that, is, uh, that is some good piano playing. Uh, I've enjoyed that today. Um, so Scotland, we've been there for 14 years, and uh, it has been quite a journey. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm sure like some of you, uh, if you've ever felt God call you to do something in the ministry, um, when he called me to be a missionary, I was very overwhelmed with the idea of that and did not feel like I was qualified to do that. Um, but God has blessed me so richly uh, to show me over the years that when he, when he puts a calling on somebody's life, he is far more than capable to, uh, to keep us where he wants us to be and to bless us beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. Um, so 14 years ago, May or January of 2008, we moved over there and, and uh, we were there for a few months in country, then started on May the 4th of 2008. We had our very first church service and I remember showing up at the community center that we had rented, and uh, we get there, not sure if we'd have anybody show up for church or not, and we uh, saw some kids playing out on the football pitch uh, there before church, so we just went out and started inviting kids to come in for church service, and uh, that was our first church service, had two little girls that came uh, in with us, and, and I'm very happy to say that over the course of the the 14 years that we've been there, we've only had, I think, three or four services that it was just our family. We've always had people to minister to. God has blessed us with that and, and feel very fortunate in that. And uh, the, those first couple of years, um, God blessed us. We grew. We had a lot of children. That was, the, that was the, the main part of our ministry was kids. And so we, we took advantage of that and we preached to them and Loved on them, let them know that, that God loved them, and, and, uh, and so we were really excited with how things were going, and then uh, two th the end of 2009 comes around, we had some issues with our visa, which uh, brought us back to the States for a little bit to get that sorted out. Uh, back over in Scotland, 2011, when we went back, we only had a few of our people that, uh, that we had built up um, there, so we really were starting over again in our ministry, and uh, at that time, we had had a, a youth group from another church here in, in Texas. Uh, they had scheduled to come over and visit us, and we had all planned to go out and do leafleting and 
door knocking and all that. And so, uh, so then I'm like, well, we're actually going to be out of the country. Um, how do you all want to handle that? And they're like, well, we're still going to come. Uh, so that group came over, and I had another missionary that had filled in for me. So when they came, they went around the city and did leafleting. And I had Jeff, uh, Jeff and Shelly Smith were filling in as missionaries for me there. Um, so Ms. Brenda, the, the lady that's not here with us tonight, but she is here in Texas with us, she got one of the John Romans booklets through her door. And she had been seeking the Lord and looking for him and crying out to him and asking, you know, if you're real, show yourself to me. And she got one of the leaflets and she hung it on her refrigerator uh, there and she would read it and then uh, go about her business and then read it again. And uh, over the course of a, a month or two, she continued to just read that. Uh, and then uh, there was a number there for Jeff, uh, which she contacted them and uh, Jeff and Shelly went over to her house and explained how, how to get saved, and she, uh, she prayed and asked the Lord to save her. So when we came back in 2011, we have this new woman uh, it's at, at our church. Never met her before, uh, and so she wasn't too sure about the big crazy Texan. Uh, I was a little bit scary to her, so she wasn't sure if she was going to stick around with me or not, uh, but, I, but I won her over uh, eventually. And I, want to, I just want you to know that, uh, and that she is such a blessing. And I'll tell you, for a year, we had a bunch of kids. We built our youth ministry back up, but she was the only adult. And I'm going to tell you, uh, as a preacher, it is very difficult. You know, you try to make eye contact with the crowd, and you look around. It's very difficult to do that when it's just one lady. And so you can't do the whole sweep around the room and act like you got a lot of people. But she... She would sit like right here in the front and she would just look at me and smile and I would preach to her and, and uh, those were the beginning years. And, uh, and God just blessed and blessed and uh, met new people and uh, had them come in and over the course of these years now we've, just, uh, we've grown into a melting pot. And you know, we, we thought when we moved to Scotland, me and Janet, we thought, well, God's called us to the Scottish people and he has. But he's given us so much more than that. And we have, we have a melting pot of uh, cultures in our church. And it's just amazing. Every Sunday we go and we look at our group and we have uh, people from Africa and Poland and Scotland and, and uh, just all different kinds of people coming and serving the Lord together. And that's what it's all about, just to watch everybody come in, uh, lay aside our Chinese uh, group as well. And, and so... Uh, uh, we've been fortunate now. We had a family move from Hong Kong. He was a pastor there, got saved in a missionary church in Hong Kong, and uh, he came with a heart to reach the Chinese people there. And so me and him talked, and we started a Chinese ministry. So now we have a, a, a Chinese ministry as well that is going at the same time as our English services. Um, so it has just been such a blessing to see what God can do. And you just, you know, the thing is that you just never know what God's going to do. He's great with surprises. And, you know, we, we think we've got it all figured out, but he just likes to just throw in new stuff that we don't expect uh, just as an extra blessing. So Sunday, May the 1st, uh, 2022, we had our 14th anniversary. And uh, for that, we had 52 people. Uh, in our service on our 14th anniversary. And so it's just, again, it's been an amazing journey to see what God can do uh, if you'll just really just get out of the way and let him do it. Uh, uh, he, he is an amazing God that we serve, and he is still working today. I, I remember so many times when I was on deputation, um, well-meaning people, I'm sure, but they would say, oh, you know, Scotland's the graveyard for missionaries. And, oh, uh, God's not working. We heard God's not working in Europe anymore. Uh, I think you should tell some people that are, that are sitting in a church in Perth, Scotland, that God's not working anymore. Um, he, he, he's not done. He's still he, anywhere in this world, God can still work. And so uh, we're just so thankful to you as a, 
supporting church. You guys have been there with us from the very beginning, and you've prayed for us, and uh, you supported us financially, but you've supported us with those prayers and uh, just been there holding the ropes for us here. And uh, we're just so thankful to have people like you that love us and uh, you're an, extent, an extended family uh, to us. And, and so we're thankful for that. So uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those if I can. Or for, I guess I should introduce the rest of you guys, shouldn't I? It's all about me. Uh, so you don't care anything about them. So uh, my, wife, my wife, Janet, who played the piano a moment ago, you've got to stand. You want to be introduced, you've got to stand up. And then this is Nicole, and she is, uh, she's 18. She's been with us now for five years. And then my son, Dylan. My daughter, Danielle. And my other daughter, Taylor, who sang for us there a moment ago as well. So now if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. All right. If, yes. Church of Scotland. So uh, it's, a, it's a Calvinist, Presbyterian uh, mindset. And so uh, that's what most people would claim to be. Uh, most people haven't attended a church. They don't go to church, but they were christened in the Church of Scotland. So that's what they are. And uh, uh, they have no idea anything about the Bible. They have no idea what they believe, how to get saved. Um, most don't really believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, and, uh, and so it's, it's sad, but yeah, they're the predominant, then you have Catholic would fall in right behind that, then probably uh, the Church of England would probably fall in third behind that. Yes? Um, yeah, there are. I mean, there, we have probably 15, 15 or so missionaries there in Scotland, um, and they all belong to a different uh, organization than us. I will say that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that uh, say they're Baptist missionaries, but I don't, I don't know that I really classify them as that but, uh, any longer. A uh, lot's changed, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, they're not, uh, they're not, they don't have the same stand that, that we do, unfortunately. So I don't really, I only have a handful of guys that I fellowship with uh, over there uh, because of that. So. Yes? Yeah, I have a, a friend, Don Clow. He's, uh, he's up in a place called Fockabers. Um, uh, then there's a national pastor, John Good, Goodwin. Uh, he's there. He's in the Glasgow area. Um, beyond that in Scotland, uh, we, ha we have a few. Who's, uh, who's the guy down there? Vogelpohl? Yeah. Vogelpohl, he's down around. Uh, he's in the Glasgow area as well. Um, so we have some over in Dundee. So there's probably about... There's probably about six or seven guys that are still sticking with it. Um, the population of Scotland is about four million, five million. Uh, you have the biggest population would be in Glasgow. Uh, it's, uh, it's about almost two million there, and then about one and a half million in Edinburgh, and then you would have Aberdeen, um, Inverness, with, and Dundee, probably around 150, 200,000 people in each of those, respectively. Uh, then you get into smaller ones like us, uh, Perth, with about 50,000. And then you have just a bunch of small communities beyond that. Yes? You want to answer that?
We had a lot of burned mills because of that. <laughs> what? I'll get to you. Yes. <sighs> Weather is different. Food is different. The people are really different. Um, uh, it, they speak English, and that probably is about the only true similarity to, uh, to life over there. Everything else was a learning, uh, learning for us. So the language... Uh, the language for me was probably the biggest thing because it was. It, we felt like at the end of the day, we would like stare at their mouths to try to understand what they're saying, and you just felt like you had a headache by the time you got home. So it was a little, it was difficult. But I had a question back. You do. You do. There's, I think three, three different branches of the. Um, Church of Scotland, but ultimately all of them are Calvinist, so just depends on what level of Calvinist they are. So, yeah. I've had, I've had some interesting debates with uh, some of the ministers there from the, uh, from the Church of Scotland. So, it's, uh, I, had, I had one, um, we were talking about Calvinism, and uh, I, I used that verse on, with him um, about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so I asked him, I said, so who can commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Because they believe that God's called you know, the elect and there, there's nothing they can do. So I said, who can commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And he, you could see the wheels turning in his head because he couldn't answer it because he knew if he did that he was hung either way. So... <laughs> He was, uh, he said, he said, well, I preach Arminian, but I believe Calvinist. And I'm like, how does that work? So you, you get that a lot. When you paint them into a corner, they, uh, they tend to come up with some crazy answer, and then the discussion is over. But, you know, our job is to sow seed and let God do the rest. Yeah. What kind of food do... We eat there, so we we've tried to introduce them to a lot of uh, a lot of American food. So, Scott, Scott, plug your ears. I don't want to make you. Scottish food is very bland, and so we weren't we weren't really sure. Now the chippies are great, and we love that. Uh, but so it, it, we we like spicy food. We love Mexican food and. All that, so we've tried to introduce them to it, um, but get this: they 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 put nutmeg in like their fajita seasoning, their Mexican food. So they put nutmeg in it, and I'm like, where did you visit <laughs> the nutmeg in Mexican food? I don't understand that. A chippy at fish and chips. Chips are fries, so uh, fish and chips, and uh, that is very good. Fish is fresh, delicious. Uh, if you ever go to the UK, make sure and visit a chippy, and uh, uh, you will enjoy that for sure. So, my favorite lasagna. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Uh, last question first, yes. Uh, there is, 
the animosity towards the British. Um, um, as far as Americans, you know, I heard on deputation, everybody's like, oh, the, uh, they hate Americans over there, and I just haven't found that to be true at all. Um, you might come across a person every once in a while that doesn't like you being there, but for the most part, they, they love us and uh, have no problem with Americans, yeah. Just jump in. I mean, everywhere, everywhere is an opportunity. So go to, when you go to the stores, try to get in the same line with the same checker uh, over and over and over again so that you see them and get a chance to talk to them. Um, uh, for a long time, I mean, my, my hair is, you know, my hair is uh, rebelling against me and uh, trying to leave, but uh, I, I like it to look okay, but I've gone to, I've gone to barbers over there that I didn't really care for uh, just to kind of build that relationship and get a chance to witness to them. But, I mean, it, it's, we have found over there it's just all about relationships. So Janet, she's, you know, she uh, deals with the youth ministry over there, and she is involved in all of those kids' lives. Uh, and, and now the, we have the trust of those parents because they know that we are taking care of their kids. And we, we you know, they send them to us and trust us with them, and we, you know, we honor that trust and cherish that trust that we've built that kind of relationship. And we've seen, you know, with some of the things that we do at the church, we have outreaches and we do a lot of dinners at the church. And uh, we just, for Christmas, we had uh, a church, a Christmas dinner, and we had 82 people at the Christmas dinner. And that was a lot of parents uh, of these kids. It's the first time that they've ever come into our church building. And so, uh, but it just takes time. So we do all kinds of stuff, yeah. So I guess I better start preaching, huh? Or we're going to be here all night. All right. And we don't want that. <laughs> so gonna, tonight's message is going to kind of be along the same vein as, uh, as the one this, uh, this morning. And the title for the message tonight is The Battle for the Mind. And... I will start with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. I guess I better get these out. Ephesians 6, verse 11, a very familiar verse for us, but you know, I want to start by saying there's nothing easy about living a Spirit-filled life. It is, it is an incredibly hard thing to, to walk with God the way that God intends for us to walk with Him. There is nothing simple about it, and it's not meant to be simple. It sets apart the, the sold-out, born-again believer. It sets them apart. That true idea of sanctification, of being set apart to God, to be something that stands out in this world of filth that we live in today. It, it is not meant to be something simple that we can just do like everything else that we do in our life that just comes so naturally and easy for us. It is meant for us to, to wake up in the morning every day and to make a conscious decision to say, today I will walk with God. Lord, I belong to You today. And yesterday is gone and whatever failures and faults might lay back there, it is over and I have a clean slate this morning that I can learn from and get up and walk with You today and see what You can do in my life. This is the journey, the, the, the privilege that you and I have been given as believers is to have this opportunity to wake up every morning with God and have a fresh new start to do something great for Him. And so Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's coming for you. Because you wake up in the morning, he's right there at the side of your bed, ready to get the day off to a great start for him. He's not sitting back waiting to see what you're going to do. He's on the, the attack. And that verse tells me something. Put on the whole armor of God 
that ye may be able to stand. He doesn't say, well, I feel particularly weak in this area today, so I think I'll put on this piece of armor to help with that particular area. He says put on the whole armor every day. Get dressed every morning. And if I don't do that, then the implication here of this verse is I'm not going to be able to stand. I am going to fail. If I refuse to take what God has given to me to fight this battle, then I am going to fail. And we have so many Christians that scratch their heads and wonder, why does this keep happening? Why do I keep failing? Why do I keep falling short? Because we refuse to take what God has given to us and dress ourselves and get ready to face the battle that is coming to us every single day. We are not fighting against a human foe or a human army. It is a spiritual battle and Satan is at the forefront of that battle and he desires nothing but to drag you down and everybody that matters to you in your life to drag each one of us down so that we will not have any testimony out there in the world today. All he has to do is just get you to trip up just a little bit, take your eyes off the goal, quit looking at God, and start looking at the circumstances of your life and saying, woe is me. Look at how terrible things are. And it's easy to do in this world, isn't it? There's so much to look at that is horrible and quite frankly, be easy to throw in the towel. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So from this, I, I, I get the idea that the Christian life is a life of conflict. It is a life that will be spent in battle one day to the next until I draw my last breath. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus speaking here. And he gives, a, gives us a little insight into service to him. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. <laughs> and I just want to say from that, we stand in good company. We, we have the... The, the, the times that we will just be attacked by the devil and we, we want to stand back and say, God, why is this happening in my life? God, I've been faithful and we get unhappy about it and we don't like and, and we don't. None of the battle is fun. Battle's not fun. Regardless of how it looks on TV and, you know, these guys flying around with swords and doing incredible things. It's not fun. Real battle is not a joy. But he says here that, we'll be, that blessed are they who go through those things, that deal with those problems in life. And he reminds us that there were people that's gone before us that have faced that. And how many of us as believers don't sit and read our Bible and say, oh man, if I could only be like, you fill in the blank, whoever your favorite biblical character is, a Moses, or a David, or Joshua, or a Paul. Oh, if I could only be like that. And Jesus says, hey, you can. <laughs> you can. Just get out there in the trenches and start fighting. Just put on the armor and get out there and go and do what I've called you to do. Later, Jesus, He commissioned His disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He sends them out. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, 
They will scourge you in their synagogues. They shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. We, lo- we love, you know, we're big about military here in this country, and they have their recruiting posters and all these catchy slogans. Be all you can be. This is Jesus' slogan. That's motivation 101 right there. <laughs> Join my army and they're going to hate you. You're going to die. Your, your dad will try to kill you. Your brothers try to kill you. Everybody's going to hate you. You'll be persecuted your whole life. Have no friends. You're going to be out there by yourself. Woo! Where do I sign up for that? That's great. But that's the life. That's the life that we are choosing. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And this is where the battle takes place here. This is where we lose or win in this walk with God. Renewing your mind. Getting it back in the place where it needs to be to walk with the Lord. So I think first of all, we have to prepare our minds for action. Prepare our minds for action. Is it okay if I go over tonight? Okay. I ain't going to finish it unless I do the whirlwind tour here. So when I was the youth pastor at, uh, at Boulevard, um, we're supposed to have wisdom as youth pastors, aren't we? But uh, looking back, we do some, some things that probably weren't always the wisest of decisions. And one, one, we, we did the camp out there. Um, and so we would take all the guys and get out there and do a camp out. And then we, would, we had some uh, people that had paintball equipment. And I would rent paintball equipment. And we would have our own little paintball wars out there. Um, so we had a, a larger group that decided to come to this, and we've got everything set up, the tents all set up, and all the boys are ready to play paintball. So I, I get out there, and as a good youth pastor leader, uh, setting the example, we don't have, we don't have enough goggles and, and helmets and all that stuff to, to play. So I figured, what could be the harm? I'll just, I've got a pair of sunglasses. So I can go out and, you know, we can get out there and still be able to play. So uh, we're out there running in the woods, and I'm, I'm doing paintball with a pair of sunglasses. And, and uh, fortunately, God saw fit not to uh, uh, cause harm that day. But, you know, sometimes we're not prepared for the battle, are we? I didn't have the right equipment. I mean, I knew what the right equipment was, and I knew how to take advantage of the right equipment. I knew how to put the right equipment on. And I knew what it was, that it was good for me to make that choice, but instead I chose to go with my gut. And that's not the greatest choice. And don't we do that with the Lord? We know where the equipment is. We know what it's meant for. We know how to put it on. But we don't prepare properly for this battle. We just do things how we want to. And the Apostle Peter, he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he makes that expression there, gird up the loins of your mind. 
what he's alluding to then, they didn't, they didn't have all the fancy jogging outfits that we have today. So they just wore their robes. And if they were going to have to run, they would take that robe and be able to, they would gird it up so that they would be able to run freely and not trip over the, the garment. And so he's kind of making this illusion to gather that robe up and to prepare yourself and get ready for what's coming. Gird up the loins of your mind, he says there, and be sober. And so we are called then to enter this battle with the idea that I need to make a conscious effort. I understand that we talked about this morning that this is a race. And I'm going to be running. I'm going to be, I'm going to be trying to achieve something in this race uh, that, is, that is pressing for the mark to, to try to do the very best that I can. And in order for me to do that, I can't be tripping and stumbling and falling over the garment that, that is around my feet. I have to prepare myself to get, to get in the right place to fight this battle, to run this race, to, to be where God wants me to be. And so, Peter, using that expression, he's saying to put out of your mind, to, to get out of your mind all those things that will impede your progress. I've, I've often sat and thought about this. Why didn't Jesus come during this time? He could easily have come in a time when we have internet and TVs and you know everybody can see. He could have been broadcasting himself around the world in today. Why didn't he do that? Because there's too much distraction out there. There's too much out there that, that pulls us away and draws us from serving God. There's so many voices today. I, tell, I have a lot of people over there in Scotland because I think that there are a lot of people are, are searching for the Lord. And the problem with that is they get on the Internet and they start trying to find out what's right on the Internet and then they come to me, and I sit down, and I try to talk with them and counsel with them, and it is almost impossible because, well, so-and-so said on the Internet, and I don't care what so-and-so said. The Bible says this, but so-and-so says this. Well, that doesn't matter. God didn't ask his opinion. He said in his Bible, this is what we're supposed to do. But so-and-so said this. We, we can keep going around on this all day if you want to, but the, the, you need to go to the Bible. I actually had somebody tell me, uh, talking with them, he kept saying this, and I said, I said, well, that sounds great, but this is what the Bible says. And I'd read him a, a verse, and he'd say, but, well, but I think this, and I'd read him what the Bible says, and I'd read this, he'd say this, and I'd read what the Bible says. And he finally says, you know, this is the problem I have with people like you. And this is a guy that goes to church, and, and you know, he, he thinks he's a Christian, he says, this is a problem I have with people like you. You're always quoting scriptures. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of the point, isn't it? I mean, otherwise, we can just make up whatever we want to. And that's the world we live in today. Everybody's got an idea of what they think the Bible says rather than just let the Bible say what it, what it says. God's pretty good at saying what he means. He does not need our help. No, at no point... In my ministry, did God ever come to me and say, well, well, Russell, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Would this be a good course of action? He has never one time done that. And I'm thankful because I would mess it up. I would make the wrong choice. Peter's saying here to get those things out of our minds, anything that would impede our forward progress, to get it away from us. Our minds get so easily crippled by all the things that are in our way today. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, we see, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. We're spending too much time thinking about stuff that doesn't fit those qualifications. 
And I know we, enjoy, we want to enjoy life. We want to have a good time and laugh and have fun. But at what expense? Is it worth it if it pulls us away from our relationship with God? Is it worth it, really? I would say no. Second, we need to guard access to our minds. Guard access to our minds. And this is what advertisers are doing all around the world today. They, they have focus groups to sit and figure out what it is that they can put on a TV or on a page, a printed page, that will cause us to stop and take notice of their advertisement. Billions and billions of dollars are spent trying to figure out how to get our minds focused on something that, quite frankly, we don't, we don't have any business focusing on. And, I mean, you, you, you see it. I know you guys see it, and you hear it from the pulpit. You know, you have all these commercials, and, and they always use, you know, barely clothed people to sell their products. And it's like insurance. What does that have to do with insurance? But they know what gets us. They know what will catch in our mind and, and bring us to them. And we have to guard access. It's so important for us as a parent, isn't it? I mean, when, when my kids were young, I didn't just throw them in front of a TV and say, see you in about 15 years. Do what you want to. They were very guarded. There wasn't access to everything in their life. Why? Because as a good parent, I understood that there were some things they didn't need to see. That it would forever warp their mind. And we would like to believe as adults, well, I can handle that. No, you can't. No. God understands that we can't. There is no age that we reach that we, we finally don't need God's guidance anymore. We constantly need to guard what's coming into our heads. Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, who? The young kid? No, everybody. As we, the, the way that we think. And we have to guard that access that Satan has into our life. And this is where Satan has done a great job. He is a master. He is, there's a million things that we can look at. That path, that huge, wide path just grows bigger every day. That narrow path of truth is still there where it's always been. And we are trying to find that path in our life to make it through. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can we find the will of God? Don't be transformed to the world. Don't do what the world says we should do. Thirdly, take, er take captive every thought. Take captive every thought. When I was a boy, I was, I was in my teen years, I guess. So my parents had bought me one of those old Daisy BB guns. So the one, you'd shoot it and you could see the BB come out the end of the gun. Didn't have a whole lot of power, but it was still fun to, to mess around with. And so I enjoyed that. Well, I had two friends, brothers, that for Christmas, they got those brand new air rifles, the pump-up pellet guns, and you could sit there and pump it up, and it would shoot, and it was really good. So, well, Mitchell was the older brother, and Scotty was the younger. And we convinced Scotty to, <laughs> we were going to play war. And we convinced Scotty to, uh, to take my gun, and uh, we put him out in a boat in, in this little pond uh, there by our house. And so he was the Navy, and me and Mitchell were the Army and the Marines. We left the Air Force out. Uh, sorry if there's any Air Force people here. It's just because we didn't have a plane. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have done something. But, uh, so, 
Scotty's out there in the boat, and we're with those nice pellet guns, and we're pumping those things up and shooting at him, and he, ow, ow. And we're just sitting there shooting away for a long time. He's got my little BB gun, and it's not, we're not even getting hit. He can't even get to us with a gun, and so we're just sitting there peppering him with pellets for about, about an hour or so, and he's out in the boat, and he's like, I, I give up, and we're like, you can't. There's no surrender. Uh, so we just kept on shooting and shooting. We weren't taking any captives that day. But the Bible, you know, we need to, we need to be careful in our life and, and guard against what we're having come in. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so we again understand that this battle that we're fighting, it is a spiritual warfare that is taking place, and we are fighting against something that we cannot see, but we can certainly feel. And the presence of Satan, we know is there. And we will acknowledge readily that, that, that he interacts in our life in ways that we don't like. But God says, hey, get ready for that. He says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they are mighty through God. And so God has taken, He has designed and fit a special set of armor for you to be able to put on that is uh, to be worn every day. And it is mighty. It, is, it has power beyond anything that we can comprehend. And again, I say we, 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 we get up and we fail to, to avail ourselves of this armor that we have access to. And I, and I will forever wonder why. Because we have a lot of problems in our life. We, have, we deal with a lot as Christians. And if you go around and you talk to Christians all around the world, we're suffering and we're going through hardships and trials, things that we don't understand why. And very often it is the failure to prepare ourselves to take captive things in our life that are harming our relationship with God. He says, cast down er imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I'll be honest with you, that's hard. That sounds a little bit unfun. You mean I gotta sit and I've just gotta tax over and pour over every thought that I have in my day? And I mean that 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 sounds like to me what I was describing to you about trying to learn the Scottish language. I'm just staring at their mouth. What? What are you saying? I know there's a word there somewhere, but I don't know what it is. And that's what it feels like. But that's what we should be doing. In our life, examining the things, the thought processes, the things we say, the places we go, the people we're talking to, what we watch, what we listen to, all those things in our life, we should be filtering it through, hey, is this what God wants me to do? And you know, we will reach a point, when we start doing that, it'll be difficult. Because we're going to find that there's a whole bunch of things that need to be gone out of our life. Things that need to be changed in our life. Things that should never have been there in the first place. And so at the very beginning part of that, it's going to be difficult. But once we start weeding out some of those problems in those areas of our life, it'll be getting, to get easier and easier and easier. We'll find ourselves later on that there's not such a problem walking with the Lord. 
thinking godly thoughts and thinking about God and allowing Him to be able to be prevalent in our life at all points, in all places, no matter what the circumstances are, it will become easier and easier and easier in our life. The problem is, do we take that first step? Are we willing to begin to take captive those thoughts that are not pleasing to God? Psalm 101. Verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Is there anything in your life that shouldn't be there? Is there something that if Jesus were to come to your house that you would be quick to hide that away? Say, well, I don't want him to see that. Those are things we need to get rid of. Purged out of our life to win this battle of the mind. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. There's a lot we could do, but it doesn't mean we should do it. There's a lot of things that we could have, and they're not necessarily wrong, but they're just not necessary. They don't have to be there. We can get by without them. David said in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We have some instruction in the Word of God of how to keep ourselves pure. And for each one of us sitting here, that ought to be our primary goal. Our primary desire in life is that my mind would be at a place where I am in communion with my Lord and Savior, and I have that sweet fellowship with them, that really, if we're honest, if we're walking with Him in that manner, I don't think there's another relationship that we could have on this earth that would be as fulfilling as that. And we settle for something not as good. Because, <coughs> because we think it feels good. But it won't in the end. The battle for the mind is a real thing. Satan desires to... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Satan desires to, to ruin your life and your testimony and the lives of those around you. And you have an opportunity... Every morning, every church service, to come to Him and to allow Him to have preeminence again in your life. As we pray, I would ask you to do that. To let the Lord have first place. To tell Him, I, I'm tired of losing this battle. I'm tired of struggling in, in this walk with you, and I want to surrender myself to you and give you all of my thoughts, all of my desires, all of my aspirations that you would have first place. I ask you to stand with me tonight as we pray. And if the Lord is dealing with your heart, that you would give yourself over to Him. Father, we love you tonight. We're so thankful for the Word of God and the testimony of Scripture. and Lord, we understand that This fight that we are in is a serious battle that it not only affects us, but it affects others around us. It affects our testimony in front of those that are lost. It affects our walk with you and the presence that you have in our life. I pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us tonight to evaluate the things that we have allowed in. <coughs> Lord, <coughs> that we would give ourselves over to you. In Christ's name I pray.